Hey, please welcome to the show, Robin Block. Hey, Robin. Hi, well, Tom. Hey, just a, 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 as a reminder to you, maybe even, you know, you first joined us uh, three years ago when, uh, let's see, In Search of Darkness Part 1 was already out. In Search of Darkness Part 2 was soon to come out. And you were actually uh, starting to develop In Search of Tomorrow. Uh, it's all a blur. It's all I, I, <laughs> It's crazy, right? Because yeah. um, when I started Creative EC, you know, I was so gung ho, um, and it, it's always a thrill to be invited onto anybody's show. It's always a thrill, right? Um, yeah. But as the business and the team have, have evolved, I've taken much more of a back seat. Um, so I, I push out the directors of our projects and the producers of our projects to do podcast appearances, and of, often they're a lot closer to the production than I am. Sure, sure. Um, but uh, with with this particular project, um, I'm really excited about it. I'm excited about doing something new, trying trying new things, even talking about it at such an embryonic stage. Because mm -hmm. um, ideas are at that are at their most fragile when they're embryonic. So um, as our documentaries and our capability and experience have, have increased over the years, so has are like desire to iterate a little bit and try new things and i think the biggest sort of mission for me and for and for creative ec is to create more of a sense of intimacy between not just us and our supporters but between the projects we create and and the the backers of those projects we want to create something which um people can feel that they're really part of the journey all the way through and so it's not just, you know, we're going to make it, we're going to make this project, see you when it's done type of thing. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, and, and you and just not to bury the lead here, but uh, of course, we're talking about the fact that uh, you're now working on an expanded documentary that focuses on John Carpenter's 1982 film, uh, The Thing. And, you know, it occurs to me that uh, in the in your prior documentaries, which you've you know thoroughly examined horror films, for example, from the 1980s, dozens uh, you mentioned that, you know, last time we spoke, you know, David Weiner, your directing, uh, your director and production partner joined us as well. But now you're up front. Do you have a personal connection to this film that uh, makes you more motivated to be out there talking about it? Uh, Dave is really busy. <laughs> I think if I give him anything else to do, he might break. Right. No, David's currently in production. David's fantastic. I mean, he, he sure. um, they, you know, in Search of Darkness, um, you know, really is his franchise. He's, he's made it. Um, it's got to the point now with In Search of Darkness that um, I I never step in editorially. We'll set stuff up at the beginning. Um, when I get sent a rough cut, and obviously I see sections come through as they're being edited, but when I get sent, um, you know, a big chunk of film to watch that David's working on, it's very hard for me to be critical because I'm enjoying it so much. Um, and, and also we've just had a huge campaign really back in October for In Search of Darkness 1994 and poor old David was wheeled on everybody's podcast. He's, you know, he's sort of just getting back to his senses now, but, um, the, what's different is that we are known for the In Search of format, which is taking something really big, like a decade or an era or even a genre and kind of trying to take you on a whistle stop tour of it you know right um and that's been very successful um back in 2022 i came up with a new concept which is almost the inverse of the in search of concept so rather than looking at something that was huge that we had to whittle down inevitably just to capture into any kind of reasonable runtime I wanted to do the inverse. I wanted to tackle a specific film and go into it in detail, unpack, you know, as many elements of it as possible. And the and the first project we've done that with comes out in a couple of months. It's called Aliens Expanded. Um, I'm really excited about it. Um, it's about James Cameron's 1986 Aliens. We've got half the cast on board for it. Um, uh, you know, lots of people behind the scenes and it's not a making of it's like, let's get all the fan base together and let's nerd out about this film. Let's remind ourselves why this is so amazing. And that project from its inception to where it is now in the final stages of post-production, I think has been 
one of the best executed projects we've ever delivered. And that's partly because we, way before we went and did any crowdfunding or pre-sales, we went out to the Aliens fan base and started talking to them. We involved them mm. in this process of, these are our ideas. What do you think? Please criticize them. So at the beginning, we had, right. uh, I think, like a, a five or six page synopsis going, this is our concept. This is our idea. And we had you know, thousands of Aliens fans come in and comment on the Google Doc and we listened to it and we reiterated. Um, we went to the uh, people that run the various fan sites and said, look, will you be part of this advisor circle? Because we want to wow. really create something which is a manifestation of your fandom. And I think for us, the goal with Aliens Expanded is if you're an Aliens fan and you watch it, the first thing you'll want to do is watch Aliens straight away and it'll mm -hmm. be like the first time you're watching it. It will remind you of why you love it and you'll see it in a new new way. Right. And so that, and we, over Christmas time, we sent, I think, 200 of our backers a rough cut of, you know, it was a five-hour rough cut and it was rough as well. But wow. this is where we've got to, right? Yeah. And it's very nervous for us to, you know, it's like releasing your, baby that isn't quite ready yet but you're just gonna you know we've got to get that constructive criticism out of the way and the feedback has been phenomenal we're really excited about this launch so the way we work is we work kind of six months out from a kind of campaign um and right. so what i'm trying to do with the thing expanded so the next movie we want to look at um using this expanded format is john carpenter's the thing and so we're kind of six months <coughs> excuse me six months away from really diving into that process so this is just a discovery process for us now we wow. don't have a synopsis what we're trying to do is we're trying to elicit a projection from the the thing fan community about what they would want to see from our kind of our, our kind of project and what we want to do is we want to go almost like a scene by scene breakdown we want to explore fan theories you know different uh, uh, character profiles. We want to create something which is like a total nerd out for fans of this movie in a way that we can extract even more value from it. Right. Now, you may, wow, so many questions have come up uh, just from that one, one comment here. Uh, but you, you, you make me think almost even now as you describe this, is there an opportunity for this thing expanded to uh, itself, the documentary itself, to feel paranoid? and have mistrust and maybe in a way that the documentary itself is even a meta experience or commentary on the film. Do, do I'm know not what? a filmmaker, Ra Robin. Well, well, well yeah. I'm sensing a change of career direction for you because <laughs> like I hadn't, um, I think that's a, cr a great idea. I don't know exactly how we sort of make that happen within the format. I, can, I don't know if I can screen share on here, but I can show you how we approach a film. In Aliens Expanded through a bit of clever motion graphics, but essentially the, the expanded format, imagine you've got an editing suite in front of you and you've got the okay. whole movie, the thing on your timeline. Mm. Now imagine that timeline is three dimensional. So this, this flat film is now like a block and it's made up of all these different scenes and it's in a 3D space. And then we're the virtual camera and we're flying in, picking out a scene, going into it, deconstructing it, going off on different tangents. And so the documentary starts at the beginning where the movie starts and finishes chronologically at the end when the movie ends. Wow. And so we want to kind of go through it, but in a, in a really entertaining, entertaining way. Um, we've just had some motion graphics done for Aliens Expanded, which is the format that I want to carry on because I want to create something which is going to be familiar because um, a lot of Aliens fans love the thing, vice versa. Sure. Um, mm -hmm. But there's nothing off the table. So um, I know where I am with this is I know that I want, to, want, I want it to stick in that format and I know that I want it to speak to super fans of the thing. So this isn't for a general audience. This isn't going to be on Netflix. This is if you've watched the thing 40 times, this is yes. for you, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, and I want this to be a premium piece of entertainment but really focused on a narrow audience. And so I've been having conversations with leaders in the kind of thing fan community and like it's this weird camaraderie, you know, mm -hmm. so if I saw you walking down the road and you had a thing t-shirt on, 
<laughs> we just quietly acknowledge each other, you know, mm -hmm. and, and we'd know there'd be an almost like an unsaid thing that we're cool, right? Like it's that kind of thing with, with the thing. And um, I'm it's having a lot of you fun. say it that way because uh, to think that a, a film that is largely about mistrust and after you can spend all this time with a group of other men, in the end, you still don't know, you, you don't know who is, you know, the, the thing, essentially, that that type of film would bring other people together. Crazy, isn't it? It's, it's, that's the thing with horror. Um, yeah. But it's one of those titles, which, you know, it, it's well known that it was underappreciated. It's it took a long time for it to find its audience, but the audience is, is there. You know, one of the things we do, and what we're doing right now, is we're doing a validation you know, like there's nothing set in stone. Part of this process I'm going through is to test the demand. Is this something that there is an audience that's going to step up and be part of it? You know, that and all of our projects now have to go through this lengthy validation process because we're at a stage now where we can't commit to a project if we can't be certain the audience is there. Right. Um, and, and so, but so far it's, it, the you know i've been running this like a week and a half um it, it's been phenomenal i'm getting the same kind of vibes that i did when i started in search of darkness mm. you know and part of my job at creative ec is to pick up on the signals and timings and you know and it's it's like in the ether and i've had and i test everything and i kill a lot of projects if i can't projects that i'm close to that I can't kind of see the demand and I'm having the, the opposite experience. Not only do I, I love this movie personally, yeah. but everyone's showing up. I'm getting messages daily. Um, people are commenting on our socials. I think uh, you know, just before I came on the show with you, we'd had like 430 survey responses. Wow. Right. And that's off about 15 social media posts. Right. And at the time of this recording, we haven't even emailed our own backers, backer base about this project because we've got other projects coming out so we don't want to start getting people excited for stuff right. so this is kind of not on the down low but it's like this is very focused on like grassroots thing fans before we start making it a big you know like in the next couple of months i want to come back to everybody with a really clever well thought through synopsis for people to pick apart you know tell us what they like what they don't like you know, and eventually before we go to um, a pre-sale, which is looking like July 2024, that's our window for this. Okay. Um, um, the, like we want to have almost had it peer reviewed. So we create a roadmap for something that people really want. So that's why, you know, your idea about keeping it, you know, meta and keeping it kind of paranoid, that hadn't even occurred to me. So yeah. it's a good idea. It's clever. You can have it. It's free. So you, I'll give you a copy. All right. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. So obviously, you know, in Search of Darkness, you did dozens of horror films. Now you, you talk about these expanded that you're working on. First one, Aliens is due out. You're working on the thing. What is, two of my favorites. Uh, but what is it about those two films or the thing in particular that uh, makes it deems it worthy of this type of uh, examination? Is it the fan base? Is it the film itself? I think you're right. I think it's the fan base, um, but it has to be the film. So there's certain, I mean, I feel like an affinity with you and your show and what it's about because um, the first two uh, films we've decided to cover with this format are films that were made in the 80s. And there's certain movies, uh, you know, what I'm about to say, like disclaimer, it's really subjective, okay? <laughs> but I, I think there's certain films that are perfect movies. Sure. And, and a perfect movie will be re relevant in a hundred years. People will still watch it. Right. And the, you know, aliens is, I think a perfect movie. I've what, you know, I've had to watch it more times this year. Understandably, every time I watch it, I see something new. Every time I watch it, I'm still amazed at the reality, the authenticity, the believability of this universe that's been created, the, the, the action, the drama, the character, like everything is just on point and that's a perfect film. Um, I think the thing for different reasons is a perfect film. I think that, that strategically one of the things we're doing is we're doubling down on the horror audience, which is the biggest part of our audience. Um, and 
the thing is often touted as like one of the greatest horror movies mm-hmm. um, of all yeah. time. But also, you know, I went to see it a, um, a couple of weekends ago in London at the British Film Institute. So beautiful, like 4K, amazing cinema in London, packed, re-watching the thing. And it nothing feels like a performance. As soon as that opening shot of the helicopter or the, the kind of Arctic landscape and then you see the helicopter, right. like mm-hmm. you're back in the game, you know, and just the the tightness of the editing nothing's dated nothing's dated you know the i was seeing people in that audience two weeks ago reacting to seeing that movie for the first time and you know 40 something years later yeah that's amazing and so the author the truth in that film that kind of alternate universe in that film stands up it will still stand up in 100 years hasn't been bettered um, and that's why it's relevant, but also specifically with the thing, because you've got this projection onto this movie by the fan base. Mm-hmm. So you've got the computer game kind of sequel. You've got the kind of remake prequel that was, you know, poorly received. I think that's yeah. not a bad film actually, but it was poorly received. And um, you've got all these fan theories, endless um you know recently kurt russell's still recently kurt russell's talking about the ending right yeah. like it's sometimes i don't even think filmmakers are aware of this when they create but sometimes things just have a have an afterlife and with the expanded format it's been set up for the fandom to explore these avenues and in and in an entertaining way and have fun with it and go off on tangents and just what would this what would this mean if child was the thing what would this mean if you know so and right. it, you know the the fan base as i'm seeing is absolutely rabid with ideas and they're always looking for new stuff um there's mystery rob botin famously yes. media shy right? right media shy we, we you know we in the survey everyone's like oh, you've got to interview rob botin <laughs> you've got to find him he's like the white whale right he's like mm-hmm. the moby dick um of this and and what i would say is absolutely he is probably top of the list for interviews you want obviously when someone makes a decision to stay out of the public eye deliberately you have to respect that but we're gonna absolutely try uh make him an offer he can't refuse i don't know but like it's sort of we're gonna try uh to get something with him because i don't know if he really fully understands how much his work has impacted pop culture mm-hmm. you know yeah. and how much people want to celebrate him and it's funny because the when i look at the statistics from the like the demographic from people who have signed up to the survey like i'm 46 right like the the median age is like from like 36 to 54 huh. there's, there's a kind of generational relationship with this movie that's quite interesting yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, no one's really come along and and produce something which explores all of these things. And I, that really excites me. Uh, that's your in, Robin. That's your in. Look, this is your in to the paranoia thing. Rob Oteen, he's removed himself because he doesn't trust maybe something. You got to find Look, you doesn't trust the media, probably. Don't blame him. <laughs> but, um, if you can interview him by the end, then the whole thing can work up to that. Mr. Yeah, Man. maybe. I mean, I mean the, the, w- one of the things that we're, we're doing now is we're calling it an interactive documentary because um, we want to create, we want to sort of create a year long celebration of the thing. So while we're in production, we want to have former cast, crew, experts, the backers all come together for these live events, for these vidcasts, just like this where we all start exploring tangents and topics all the way through the process. And we've done that with our Aliens Expanded. We've had like half the cast come on and do Q and A's. And we've had um, some of the show hosts from some of the main Aliens fan um, entities come on and explore different avenues. And it's been so much fun. So it's added about another sort of 12, 12 to 15 hours of entertainment for this kind of project. And I want to double down on that for the thing expanded because um, there's so many topics to explore. We can't, even at our best, we can't 
within about four hours, you can't cover everything. Sure. The, uh, you know, just to be clear, I suppose, because you talked about it now being a year long interactive documentary, and you talked about it being expanded and and maybe it's because I know you produce sci-fi documentaries that conjure some images of Minority Report, this three-dimensional, you know, sort of timeline. But it's it's go- it, it it isn't the medium is still the same as your other documentaries, right? We're watching it from beginning to end. We can't actually change what we're focusing on as a viewer. No, no, it won't be. It won't be. Um, I've got I've got to sort of just be careful what with what I say because nothing's off the table. If everyone was like, we want an interactive DVD or we don't do DVDs anymore, Blu-ray. Right. Um, then I'd have to take that into consideration. But no, it's a, it's a film that you watch, um, okay. and it's going to be long. You know, very hard to get these things under a runtime of about four hours. Um, but when I talk about it being interactive, I mean the, the the journey for backers. So our focus isn't really on general distribution. Our focus is on um, creating you know creating. Um, a premium entertainment product, but for a very relatively small audience, you know, five to 10,000 people, um, but give them something that they just couldn't get anywhere else. And that's our kind of raison d'etre. That's kind of what what we're doubling down on. And as part of that, we want to be different. We want to be able to say, look, there's this interest in this subject. Let's get all the experts, everyone relevant around this and create this celebration. And at the end... It's a bit like in Search of Darkness. At the end, you get like, you know, the, 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 the merchandise, your names on it. It means something. You know, this is a manifestation of tens of thousands of people's interest in 80s horror. It's why when people occasionally put them up on eBay, they go for you know, hundreds of dollars because it's quite rare. And I think what we're trying to do is double down on that. We want to create an experience and a product which... If, if, you know, that signal that you're following, it speaks to you. Anything less, and it's not, that's not what we're interested in. We don't want to dilute this. We, you know, if you've never seen the thing before, you're not going to enjoy our documentary. So, you know, it's, <laughs> you know it, it's, that's not the vibe. And I want to double down on that. And I think part of that is actually just things like now, like having this conversation with you, because, you know, a large majority of your viewers, I assume, will have watched the thing. It's one of the most famous horror movies from the eighties. Um, I suspect you reached out because the thing—it's it, like a—it's like the bat signal, you know. Yes. It's kind of it, <laughs> cool, cool, you know, yes. like Thundercats. You're know, looking up, and you know. Um, but uh, but that's what it is. That's what it means to people. And there isn't something out there apart from the Blu-ray releases of the film that have excellent special features, but there isn't anything which has been a premium look at actually, let's look at this from the fan's perspective. Let's pay fan services. Let's go down all these rabbit holes. Let's explore. I mean, what does some of the cast think about its reception 40 years on? Right. You know, um, you know for In Search of Darkness, we interviewed John Carpenter and I did the interview with Keith David and he loves the fact that it's achieved this kind of cult status. And he had all sorts of stories that we couldn't put in in Search of Darkness because that the thing segment was only three and a half minutes long. And so we want to take that and make it, you know, four hours. So, right. yeah, the, the, you know, we talked about the uh, how folks still theorize about the ending of the film, um, and it seems to me that, and as also as you mentioned, it wasn't a hit when it first came out in, in the early nineteen eighties, and, and there's probably a number of different things that were working against it. Certainly not the quality of the film, but it seems like maybe there was a shift as far as uh, what filmgoers wanted to see. It was competing against ET, which was a very different type of alien story, and I think we were on that trajectory where we wanted to see more hope in our pop culture uh, coming out of the nineteen seventies and the more auteur sort of era of filmmaking and the Vietnam, you know, how Vietnam affected filmmakers and that sort of thing. But today, with the advent of the internet, <laughs> there's more conspiracy theories out there about, unfortunately, actual things that it seems like more than ever, this, I imagine this film is popular because of how folks like to find things that are potentially, you know, conspiratorial. And this film just, you know, sort of is perfect for that type of analysis. A- a- absolutely. And, and it's the way I look at it is how can you get more out of something you love? You know, and, and the reason that these fan communities exist is because it's a way to tap into something you love and further its relevance. And I think that when 
when we get a documentary right, part of that emotion that we're trying to elicit in the viewer is is nostalgia, but it's also to understand something you love in a different way. I'll give an example. Um, I love movies. I watch a lot of movies, um, but I'm no film critic. Um, my wife often has to explain to me what I've just watched because sometimes <laughs> basic stuff goes over my head. Like we all view the world differently. Um, but well, I she love... says stuff like, oh, yeah, and you make the documentaries. Yeah. No, she says she's like, well, didn't you understand that that person was the guy that did, um, no, I didn't, what, what? And then halfway through the film, she'll tell me, oh, that guy's the killer. And I'm like, how do you know? <laughs> like, what am I missing it? But um, there's certain film journalists that whenever I hear them on interviews, uh, they're just very gifted at making something that you're familiar with sound even better. So that way I'm getting more value from it. And I read... You know, I'm reading. I'm, you know, I'm reading at the moment this fas fascinating book about the thing. It's quite famous. I spoke to uh, my new friend Phil Horn. Need to give him a plug. He's just this came out last year. The, the thing, history of a franchise. Like all of this stuff, all it does is it just makes the experience richer. And the, my kind of poorly worded metaphor for this is something along the lines of the same man doesn't step in the same river twice. Right. Mm -hmm. So. I was very young when I first watched the, the thing, probably about nine or 10 years old. And it had this visceral, uh -huh. you know, experience for me. And I remember it, but I watched it two weeks ago at the age of 46 and I had a very different experience. You know, mm. I'm not the same man and it's not the same river. And I think great art that is great has that, um, has that quality to it where you can revisit it throughout your life and see it in new ways and i think that's why this film endures and great films have that i mean there's other films that i think are perfect films from the 80s you know predator is flawless mm -hmm. still you know it's not as complex it doesn't have all the fan theories that sure. you know as much as they say but um you know the, the, you know donny darko is another one for me personally whenever i watch it i see something new you know mm -hmm. and, 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 I don't think you could really set out to construct a film like that. I think that a lot of things have to happen at once and everyone has to get a bit lucky. But specifically with the thing, it's like the underdog of movies. You know, it kind of, it, 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 it wasn't a hit. It derailed Carpenter's career. But now right. it's one of the most celebrated horror movies in history. Yep. If you put on the thing in any cinema, in any city in the Western world, it will sell out. Sure, no doubt. Yeah, you, you know, you, uh, talking about uh, you can't. Uh, it takes requires a little bit of luck, uh, but it, it seems to me, and you'll know, you know better than I do, and you're you're doing the research and you're putting together this amazing documentary about the thing. Um, but I, it seems, I, I, look, I guess first with regard to the ending, for folks who don't know, it's it's ambiguous. So we've got this creature that's trying to survive. We don't know if it has. It's certainly sophisticated enough to build a spaceship, but. It's it's trying to survive, hidden among uh, whatever whatever life form it needs to, and uh, by the ending, we're not sure if there's if it's still alive or we just got some humans. I believe the ending is intentionally well. We know it's intentionally ambiguous, I, I, but to that end, the folks that theorize there's all these clues. I think Carpenter was careful to create a puzzle that has no clues in a sense, and just a lot of red herrings. Maybe, uh, do you think the ending is? more clear than that i don't know i mean i it's i love the fact it's really downbeat and dark yes and hopeless right and then um i was posting about this last week uh i think um there's a name to this theory I've been mapping. I've got a list of 20 fan theories. There's way more, but I'm putting what? them all. I, yeah. Wow, that's so way there's, more like, than there's Literally, I have, um, I have a spreadsheet of, um, of, of, of fan <laughs> oh. theories, and there's some wild ones. Um, uh, you know, there's certainly uh, some wild – here we go. I'm, just, I'm bringing it up because I'll give you the name. Yeah. Um, it's called – yeah, so this particular fan theory is the whiskey bottle theory. Oh, sure. Right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, – this is the theory that McCready gives Childs the whiskey bottle, but actually it's filled with gasoline yeah. and, and Childs drinks it and obviously doesn't spit it out, right? But also that Childs doesn't have any cold breath. 
in that sure. scene. Mm-hmm. So, you know, and I think that when my assumption with a film going in is everything's deliberate. Mm-hmm. There are no accidents. Yeah. Um, I can't remember if John Carpenter, when we interviewed him, told us, but, you know, it's it may be a subconscious thing, but, uh, you know, there's some really crazy ones on here. I, 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 I will, you know, we'll be posting more of these on our social media. There's things like the breath theory, the shadow theory, the eye gleam theory, the clothing theory, <laughs> the dog handler's keys theory. Just... I could carry on, oh, yeah. um, mm-hmm. but uh, you know, I love the fact that someone somewhere has gone frame by frame and gone, right, this is what I think. I'm going to go and post that somewhere. And then someone else has read it and gone, oh, what about this? I mean, it happened today in the comments. You know, one of the things we're doing is we're doing this survey that's really simple. We've got about four questions on it. You know, how many times have you watched a thing? You know, w- what would you like to see covered in this documentary? And, you know, tell me a memory of, like, you know, watching the thing. And it's really interesting listening to what people are saying. So I did a post last night where we just took a quote from one of the respondents who said, um, you know, essentially I'd love to understand how the thing, that film, has affected other films. Mm-hmm. You know, what influences? I mean, right now, the time of recording, they've just released, they just started the new series of True Detective, which is set in the Arctic, and it's just it yes. pays homage so much to so much to the thing, and it's still relevant. That's one of like a myriad of of films. Hateful Eight, you know, one of the people um, that we'd love to interview for this would be Quentin Tarantino because because the thing is such a big influence. And it's the kind of project where we could probably get him, you know. Right. So it's sort of. Um, a, I just, you know, we could just go on this rabbit hole. And, but I love that. You know, I think that there's, that's the kind of thing that if it's presented in a clever, entertaining way, becomes ultimate fan service. Right. Yeah. Now the, uh, look, I know we should wrap up here. I'm going to say with regard to the end, I think, well, it's interesting that folks, I don't know if these folks who do these theorize realize that they're, they're they're exhibiting the paranoia that is the point of the film you know it's almost they don't realize they've become a product of the will you're the only one who can see that you're like don't you see (laughs) (laughs) like um it is this is art imitating with life imitating art really yeah you know um yeah i mean i'm I'm, this see this conversation has been an amazing conversation because you have ideas about this, you know, and I'm taking away two, stealing two yeah, uh, from you, which is first, you know, could you present the film in a way where it becomes increasingly paranoid? Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, you said, so what was the other thing that you said that was, that was really pertinent? Um, so many things, Robin, who can yeah. remember? Well, Almost everything. But it's, but this is why I'm doing this this sort of mini kind of podcast tour is because all of these ideas that everyone has that's into this are valuable, and I, I want to kind of soak them up, take you know, document them, um, and then come back to everybody with a synopsis, a Google Doc, with right. maybe some pictures, and like this is our vision for what this you know project will be, and. I want that to be something which is criticized, embraced, ultimately refined, so we can get somewhere where everyone who's into this is very excited about this project. And it's, you know, it's the, it's not us having amazing ideas, it's the fan community kind of manifesting this for itself. So how can fans get involved? You mentioned the survey. How can uh, folks listening to this uh, help you create this uh, expanded documentary? So we've set up social media pages um, on Facebook, Twitter, X, um, and Instagram. um, And the handle is thing expanded, one word. And if you go to the bio in that, there's a kind of bit.ly link to a Google form. um, And it's super simple. And what I really want to find out is what would you want to see in this documentary? What interests you about the thing? And where are you? You know, how many times have you watched the thing? And why do you love it? You know, those are the kind of questions we want to ask. And as people sign up for this survey, it will enable us to have a dialogue 
you know, in a couple of months time, we want to get back to everybody and say, look, we've collated, you know, the insights you've given us. This is what we want to share with you. Is this what you want us to create and keep going? Um, but our window this year is May, June, July, with July being um, the first pre-sell for the thing expanded. So you know, we're in the end of January, so we're still really early. Um, but to have generated this kind of interest is a you know, hugely flattering, but just shows it's the right signals, you know. Um, and I just want to follow that kind of thread to wherever it leads. Yeah, and that folks trust you, Creative VC, uh, David, all the folks uh, behind your product, uh, your your projects with this product. I hope I hope so. You know, I feel like each time we do a project, we have to earn it. Um, you know, we're very grateful to get what we, you know, to to be able to do this work. Um, but you know, we we have to take risks. We have to get better. Even doing this, you know, I don't have an exact. I can't tell you exactly what we're going to cover because it's still being formed. But I think that's part of the beauty of getting involved. Right. 